In this lecture, we'll talk about stock market indexes and about a few aspects of trading on markets. The material from this chapter comes from Bodie Kane and Marcus section 2.4 as well as a few sections from chapter 3. Let's begin by talking about the Dow Jones Index. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, the DJIA, is the oldest U.S. index dating back to 1896. And since 1926, it's been, uh, it's been formed by 30 large stocks. So the, those stocks haven't been the same since 1926, but the index has always been formed by 30 large companies. Originally, it was just a simple average of the prices. So back in 1926, the index itself was just an average, an arithmetic average of the prices of those 30 large uh, stocks. The percentage change in the Dow was the return, excluding dividends, often referred to as ex-dividend, on a portfolio consisting of one share invested in each of the stocks of the index. So essentially, uh, you would take your you would form a portfolio by paying whatever price was necessary to purchase one share of each of the 30 stocks and the percentage change for over a period of time let's say a day or a month or a week was just the change in uh, the the uh, the average of the shares so the value of the portfolio itself is just the sum of the prices while the value of the index is the average of the prices, the portfolio being uh, the actual portfolio of shares, whereas the index is just the average of the prices of the shares. It turns out, as we'll see on the next slide, that the percentage change in the index and the percentage change in the portfolio happen to coincide exactly, and we'll see this mathematically in a moment. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average is what we refer to as a price-weighted average. The amount of money invested in each asset, that is the weight that it bears in your portfolio, is proportional to the share price because you are putting the amount of money, uh, the amount of money that you put into each one of the stocks is exactly the price of the share. However, due to splits and changes in the composition of the index, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is no longer a simple weighted average of prices, and we'll see this in a moment. So let's consider as a simple example a price weighted index of two stocks. Let's call them X and Y. Suppose the price of X is originally $25 and increases to $30, while the price of Y is originally $100 and decreases to $90. So we can do a few computations. The initial value of the portfolio, what is that? Well, it's just the summation of the two prices, $25 plus $100, so you have $125. The final value of the portfolio is the, final, the sum of the final two prices, the $30 plus $90 equal to $120. So what is the percentage change? Well, we see that the, the difference between the initial value of the portfolio and the final value is negative $5. You lost $5 over the time period. So you have negative $5 divided by the initial valuation of the portfolio, which is $125. It turns out that if you calculate that, that that is a loss of 4%. Now let's take the index. The index is not the summation of the values, but it's actually the average of the prices. So the average, the index value itself, is 62.5 initially. The final value of the index is 30 plus 90 averaged, which is 60. And that means you lost 2.5 on 62.5. So you take negative 2.5, divide by 62.5, and it turns out that that is exactly the same as losing 5 on 125. You can see that the computations are identical, except that you, the two numbers, the initial value and the final value, are divided by 2, and those wash out when you take the ratios. Now, a price-weighted index gives higher price stocks more weight in the portfolio. So let's compute the percentage change in stock X. Stock X started at started at $25 and finished at 
which means that it added value on the order of 20% if you do the computation. The percentage change in stock Y, well, it ended at $90 having begun at $100. That's a difference of $10 loss, so that you lost 10%. What is the overall percentage change in the index? Well, it's not the simple average of these two percentage changes because you have invested differing amounts of, uh, that is, different proportions of your wealth or your portfolio into each one of these stocks. If you had put half of your, uh, your money to be invested in each of the stocks, then you would have a simple average of the two returns, which would be 20 plus negative 10 divided by 2, or if we do the computation, we would say 20 plus negative 10 over 2, which is equal to 5%. You would have had a 5% gain if you had put half of your money into this stock and half of your money into that stock. But that's not what you did you actually put a much larger portion if you you started out with hundred and twenty five dollars which means you put out of hundred and twenty five dollars you put one hundred into that stock and only twenty five into that stock so you put about eighty percent of your money into stock Y and twenty percent of your money into stock X which means that ten percent the negative ten percent return carries a much higher weight in your portfolio than the 20% gain. And that's why you ended up with a 4% loss. Because in actuality, the change in the index is a weighted average according to these weights right here. It's the price of X all over the, the sum of the two prices. That's the weight that you give to the percentage change in X. And then the weight that you give to the percentage change in y is the price of y over the sum of two prices. That is, the, in, the superscripts here, zero, mean the initial prices, because those are the weights at which you invested your money. So it turns out as I previously mentioned, you invested the weight on Stock X was 20%, and the weight on stock Y was 80%. Those are the amounts of wealth that you put into each one of those stocks. The return on X was 20% positive, and the return on Y was 10% negative. So the weighted average is not just half times that plus half times that, but it incorporates these weights, and the total return on the portfolio is negative 4 and the notation here, as I explained before, the superscript refers to time period zero. I refers to uh, whichever asset, either X or Y, that you are purchasing. And the delta sub I, which is delta sub X or delta sub Y, refers to the percentage change in either of those two assets. So now let's explore why the Dow Jones is no longer a simple average of the prices, although it did begin that way. From time to time, stocks split. So a company can choose to take its, if its stock is trading at $100 and it has 100 shares outstanding, it can choose to split the stocks so that everybody who's holding those shares, go, for each share that they own, they suddenly own two shares at half the value. So the company could declare that they're a stock split, in which case those 100 shares become 200 shares, and instead of being valued at $100, they're valued at 50. So in the case of stock splits, this messes around with the, with the price-weighted average, such as the Dow Jones. So let's begin by considering the case of stock Y, which did start out at $100. And in the case of a split, uh, uh, where one share becomes two, uh, the price would fall to $50. What does this do to the index? Well, originally, the index was valued at $25 plus $100 divided by 2, so the value of the index was 62.5. Now, in order to pre what, if, if the stock split, you can see immediately 
that the 100 would change to 50, and suddenly we would have 25, 25 plus 50 over 2 equals 37.5. So the index value, by virtue only of the split, would change from 62.5 to 37.5. And that's not for any real reason. It's simply because the company declared a split. In actuality, what needs to be done to account for this split is the divisor needs to be changed so as to maintain the value at 62.5, the value of the index. So what value D is required so that 25 plus 50 over D is still equal to the original index value? If you solve this problem, you'll find that D is equal to 1.2. Interestingly enough, though, there is a real impact to uh, the, the split will still have a real impact by virtue of the fact that even though the index is now at the same value as it was before, the relative weight of Y in the portfolio is going to be much smaller because it now has a much lower price. And so future movements in the price of Y will have a smaller impact on the index than previously. Now let's consider a valuated index. The S&P 500 is an example of, of a valuated index. S&P stands for Standard & Poor's Composite 500. Here are some advantages that it has over the Dow. First, it is comprised of many more stocks. So the S&P 500 has 500 stocks in the index. And so it's much more broadly based and considered to be a better indicator in many cases of the market as a whole, rather than the Dow, which only has 30 stocks in it. And as I mentioned before, it's a value-weighted index rather than a price-weighted index. What exactly is a value-weighted index? Well, it's an index that weights each stock according to the market capitalization or the market cap of that stock. The market capitalization of a firm is simply its total market value that is the price per share the price per share times the number of shares outstanding so let's consider some examples of market capitalization continuing with our previous example for assets x and y let's suppose that x has 20 shares outstanding in the market and that y has only one share outstanding let's compute the market capitalizations the market cap at time period 0 notice the superscript for X is 20 shares times $25 per share. So what is the total value of the company according to its total number of shares outstanding? Well, that's $500. Now, asset Y at time period zero, it's valued at $100, but there's only one share outstanding in the market. So that company is worth $100. The valuated index then will put five sixths of your money into asset X and only one-sixth of your money into asset Y. Notice it's not one-fifth, but you have to sum together the one and the five so that you have a total of $600 invested, one part of which, one-sixth of which, is put into asset Y and five-sixths of which are put into asset X. Now after the price changes, we need to recompute the market capitalization. With the new price of X, the capitalization at the end of the period is $600. And with the new price of Y at the end of the period, and notice the superscripts here, 1, the market capitalization for Y is $90. So what does this do? It leaves the total value of stock equal to $690, whereas previously the total value of stock had been $600, that is 500 plus 100. So between time periods 0 and 1, the market capitalizations of the firm, the, the firms, the total market cap capitalization among the two firms has grown by $90 on 600 originally. So the total growth is 690 over 600. 
If you had begun with an index worth $100, or let's just say you had invested $100 into those two market capital capitalizations, you would see growth of 690 over 600. That is, if you had put um, five-sixths of your wealth in stock X and one-sixth into stock Y, you would see $115 at time period one. So in this case, we see that there was an overall growth in the index. You didn't lose money as in the price-weighted index because you put more of your wealth in asset X. And so at the end of the day, you had a gain of 15 on 100 or 15%. Mathematically speaking, the change in the, val in the uh, valuated index looks like this. The percentage change in X is weighted by the market capitalization of X over the sum of the two market capitalizations, which is the total valuation of the market. And then the percentage change in Y is equal to the market capitalization of Y over the sum of the two market capitalizations. So what you did is you put five-sixths five sixths of your wealth into asset X, which is paying a return of 0.2, and only one-sixth into asset Y, which is paying a negative return. This bodes well for you relative to the price-weighted portfolio, where you put much less of your wealth in the high-returning asset and much more into the low-returning asset. One of the advantages of price-weighted and value-weighted index, index, indexes is that they correspond to buy and hold portfolio strategies. So a price-weighted index, that's equivalent to just buying and holding one share, or an equal number of shares, of each stock in the index. A value-weighted index, that's equivalent to buying and holding each share of the index in proportion to its market cap. In contrast, you could form an equally weighted index where all stocks receive the exact same weight. This does not correspond to a buy and hold strategy. So you could consider with starting with equal amounts of money in stocks X and Y, so you would put half your money in X, half your money in Y. Then, as in the example above, if the price of X increases by 20% and the price of Y falls by 10%, suddenly the dollar amount that you have invested in each stock is no longer equal. You have more money invested in X, less money invested in Y. So if you want to keep the weights equal, if you want to keep half of your money in X and half in Y, you're actually going to have to sell some of your shares of X and buy some shares of Y. And that's a process of rebalancing. So an equally weighted index is not an index that corresponds to a buy and hold strategy. It requires constant rebalancing to maintain the equal portfolio weights. Here are some examples of a number of, of published indexes. The New York Stock Exchange, you could do a market capitalization of that. The NASDAQ. The Wilshire 5000. You, there are a number of sub-indexes of the S&P 500, there's a 100, and there are various others that are composites of, of the assets within the S&P 500. Now, if you actually wanted to hold one of these indexes as part of your portfolio, what could you do? Well, you could buy shares of a mutual fund that tracks the index. So there are a number of mutual funds that, that track the New York Stock Exchange or that track the S&P 500 or the Dow. Or you could buy shares of what's referred to as an exchange-traded fund, which is a portfolio of the shares of the index. We'll talk about more about exchange-traded funds in later lectures. Let's switch gears briefly and talk about how firms issue securities. The market can be divided into two broad categories. The primary market is where new shares are sold to the public. This can be referred to first, and there are two ways this can be done. Initial public offerings, which is where a firm issues new shares, and this is often referred to as going public. A firm can also uh, issue uh, seasoned new issues, and these are new shares sold by firms that already have shares outstanding. So they're adding more shares to the pool of existing shares. Then there's the secondary market. And that's where outstanding shares that have already been issued in IPOs or season new issues, 
they can be traded among people that already own them and purchased by people that don't. So the second, the secondary market, note that it does not alter the total number of shares outstanding, whereas the primary market does. Stocks in the primary market, they're generally purchased by an investment bank or a syndicate of investment banks, which is a group of banks, and they're purchased at a slightly discounted price and then are marketed by these investment banks at, a, at a, an agreed offering price. So if you take the recent example of Facebook, which uh, had a lot of hype, a number of investment banks uh, met with Facebook over time and they determined what they thought was a fair valuation. They bought the shares at a slightly discounted price and then at the date of the initial public offering, those investment banks were the ones that actually held the shares and turned around and sold them for a slight markup at the agreed on offering price. What types of markets are there? Very quickly, we can rank markets according to the organization, their organization, and the volume of trading. A direct search market is where buyers and sellers, buyers and sellers find each other directly. This is a, a market like Craigslist where, or some type of classified service where they uh, contact each other directly and negotiate prices and uh, make deals on their own. Now, a brokered market is something like real estate where the trading of asset is of an asset is high and it requires specialized knowledge such as an agent who can facil facilitate trades and negotiation between buyers and sellers. Then there are dealer markets, over the counter, OTC, such as the Nasdaq. The Nasdaq is an over the counter market where dealers buy assets on their own accounts and then turn around and sell them for slightly higher prices. And the difference is referred to as the bid ask spread which is the commission essentially that these dealers in the over-the-counter market take. Finally, there's an auction market such as the New York Stock Exchange or any type of exchange where buyers and sellers, they all converge in a marketplace and then they negotiate a price and they buy and sell. Let's now talk about buying on margin. So if you were to go and play stock trades or some other type of asset trade, you might open a margin account with a broker. This would allow you to borrow money from the broker and purchase assets with the borrowed money. The margin itself is the proportion of the purchase price provided by the investor. The purchase securities are then maintained in an account by the broker and they're monitored. The Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System has limited initial margins to be 50% of the initial purchase. That means investors have to provide uh, at least 50% of the funds in a, in a broker account to purchase assets and can borrow no more than 50% from the broker. So let's take, a, take an example of buying on margin. Let's suppose an investor opens an account with a broker with $6,000 and would like to buy 100 shares of an asset labeled W that's currently selling for $100 a share. So in order to purchase 100 shares at $100, that would cost $10,000. So that means that the investor needs to borrow $4,000 from the broker. Here's what the initial balance sheet looks like. The value of stock is $10,000. The equity that the investor begins with is $6,000, and the investor borrows $4,000 in order to purchase the $10,000 of stock. So the stock is itself the asset on the, on the asset side of the balance sheet. And then the liabilities are the $6,000 and the $4,000 owed to the broker. So what is the initial margin? It's the equity that the investor holds, which is $6,000 over the total value of assets, which is $10,000, or 0.6. Now let's say that the stock price falls to $70 per share. How does the balance sheet change? Well now, the value of stock is $7,000. It's dropped from $10,000 to $7,000. The loan does not change. The investor still owes $4,000 to the broker. So what does that do to the equity? The 
investor absorbs all of the loss into his or her equity that was held at the beginning, which means the equity falls from 6000 to 3000 So the margin now is the equity that the investor holds, $3,000 over the total value of the assets, which is $7,000, which means the margin is now 043 now, brokers can set minimal margin, mar margin requirements, known as maintenance margins. So essentially, if the asset value in the account falls too low relative to the loan from the broker, the broker has the right to seize a portion of the assets, that is, issue a margin call, and require that either the investor add cash or to liquidate some of the stocks. And if the investor doesn't act accordingly, the broker then has the right to sell some of the stocks to pay off the loan and restore the margin to an acceptable level. So for example, let's say a broker has a maintenance margin of 30%, so that the value of equity that the investor holds cannot drop below 30% of the total value of assets. What would be the lowest price that the stock W could fall to before a margin call is issued. Well, we know that there are 100 shares of the stock held by the investor at price P. So what is the total value of stock? It's 100 times P. And the equity owned, held, that is, by the investor is the value of stock minus the $4,000 owed to the broker. And that's all divided by the total value of stock which is the assets, 100 times whatever the price is. Now, that what we want to do is determine what price sets this margin exactly equal to 0.3. So let's solve for the price. It turns out if you solve for that price P, it's 57.14. So if the price had started at $100 and the um, the investor had an original margin of 60 of 0.6, that is $6,000 with a loan of 4,000. Then a margin call would not be issued by the broker until the price fell to $57.14. Now, why in the world are margins important? Why would anybody buy on margin? Well, margins have the ability to magnify upside returns. Let's say that asset W is currently selling for $100, and an investor believes that the price is going to rise to $120 next period. So let's say that this investor puts, puts $10,000 uh, of money into the stock. And when the period is over, if she was correct that the price has moved up to $120, she's earned 20%, that is, her final value of the stock will be $12,000. So she'll have earned $2,000 or 20% on that initial $10,000. Now let's say that, the, that this investor had not just invested her own $10,000, but had borrowed $10,000 at 5% interest from a broker. Then she'll earn $2,000 on her own $10,000, but the $10,000 that she borrowed will also earn $10,000 as it increase as the stock price increases from $100 to $120. That is if she uses the broker's $10,000 to purchase another 100 shares. So she'll have earned $4,000 on that total of 20,000 invested. Now recall that she borrowed this at 5% interest. 5% of $10,000 that she borrowed is $500. So when she repays the loan, she repays $10,500. $10, and her net return, the net, will be, well, she finished the period with $24,000, having started with 10, 10, and earned 4, which is a total of 20% on $20,000. She must repay $10,500 of that, and she started with 10000 of her own money, so she earned that difference on her first 10000 which is a total of 35% gain. That's actually much better than the 20% she would have earned by only investing her own money. 
Now it turns out that margins, uh, buying on margin, while it has the possibility to magnify returns, it also has the possibility to magnify, to increase downside risk, risk exposure. Here's how. So let's say that after borrowing that $10,000 from the broker, that the asset price didn't increase from 100 to 120, but it fell from $100 to $80. So now this uh, investor, not only did she use 10,000 of her own money to purchase 100 shares, but she purchased another 100 with 10,000 from the broker. So she owns 200 shares. Those are now valued at $16,000. 200 shares times $80, 200 times 80, it turns out, is equal to $1,600. Relative to the original $20,000, it's clear that she has lost $4,000 on $20,000. So after she's repaid the loan, she has $16,000 minus $10,500, on the original $10,000, she has lost 45% of her money. That's actually much worse than if she had only invested her own money. If she had only invested her own $10,000, she would have lost $2,000, and you would have had numbers here that looked like $10,000 minus zero, because there would have been no loan here, minus, sorry, the final value would have been $8,000, minus 10,000 all over 10,000, which would have been a loss of point, negative 0.2. So instead of losing 20% of her money, she's now lost 45% of her money. Let's finish up by talking about short sales. Short sales allow investors to profit from declines in stock prices. We're more accustomed to thinking of buying stocks and then hoping that the prices rise and earning gains as the prices rise. It turns out short sales are a mechanism to allow investors to profit when prices fall. So to engage in a short sale, an investor borrows a share of stock from a broker and then sells it on the market. The investor then is obligated to replace the share at a later date. So if the stock price falls, the investor benefits from selling at the high price and then repurchasing at a lower price and giving it back to the, to the broker from whom he borrowed. In between, if there's any dividend that's paid out, the investor is responsible for paying the broker that dividend because the broker would have received that if he hadn't lent the stock to the investor. So the terminology for this is that if an investor takes, engages in a short sale, they are short the stock or they've taken a short position. And then conversely, if an investor has bought the stock, which is the usual transaction that we think of, we say that the investor is long or has taken the long position. So let's look at a quick example of a short sale. Suppose asset W starts by, uh, begins the period selling for $100. And let's suppose you think that the price is gonna fall. If you, desi if you decide to borrow 1,000 shares, selling them for $100 each. So let's say I own the 1,000 shares and you borrow from me. You go and you sell them for $100 each. Then you have a total of $100,000 sitting in your account. Now you owe those shares back to me next period. If the price declines to $80, you can repurchase those 1,000 shares for $80,000 and return them back to me. And what have you earned? Well, you, you originally sold them for 100000 and you were able to buy them back for eighty, dollars so you just earned $20,000 in this process.